morning, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. One of the big advantages of working in an institution like the University of Vienna, which is a huge institution, is that you find so inspiring colleagues everywhere. And I'm really, really excited to introduce one of those really inspiring colleagues to you today. I may introduce Dr. Christina Rosconi, who is Assistant Professor at the Department of Communication of the University of Vienna. But as I may say at the very beginning, she is not only uh, working in communication sciences, holding a PhD in communication sciences, but she is also a doctor of law. So she has also she's a fully qualified lawyer. Um, after having um, received the doctor juris in law and state sciences at the Eötvös Loránd University Faculty of Law in Budapest in Hungary. So she, is, she has a double qualification, communication sciences on the one hand and law on the other hand, which makes her a perfect guest um, in, this, uh, in this environment here. She worked with international and European organizations, with national governments, regulators and companies as a senior advisor on media freedom, spectrum policy, and copyright legal frameworks. Each of those terms trigger a lot of very <laughs> inspiring things in my head. And, and on top of this, between 2004 and 2010, she served as, a chair, as the chairperson or the deputy chairperson of the Telecoms Authority in Hungary. And if you are a little bit into the field, you know that Telecoms authorities are key players in the development of um, um, IT and digitalization services in a country. Uh, she then went uh, back to academia and her research interests are specific aspects of media governance, especially the governments of spectrum and copyright, the representation of public interest of democratic values and fundamental rights within complex and highly technocratized policy and regulatory processes. She's a regular speaker at different universities, such as Oxford University. She has taught uh, at the Elte University in Budapest, um, at uh, the University of Pech, and so on. And she is a member of the advisory board of the Journal of Digital Media and Policy and chair of the Media and Advertising Division of the Hungarian Lawyers Association. So when I read such series, I always, I, I can't understand how people manage to do all this. I, 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 will, I will try to also learn this, but I will also learn a lot about Hungary, about freedom of the media, freedom of speech, and also gender related aspects of our, of our topic today. Christina, so good to have you with us. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, you have the floor. I really appreciate your presence. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and thank you so much uh, for introducing me and uh, with so nice, uh, beautiful words. Um, it's uh, really the advantage of University of Vienna to meet inspiring colleagues, and uh, it was my honor to, to meet you and mm -hmm. to learn about how you could make teaching low and lecturing low in a non-boring way. <laughs> and to, to, to showcase that um, um, legal studies and legal scholarship could be also subject to digital innovation, which is something that lawyers very often forget about. And making law, I think, to a very hot and, uh, and interesting subject. So, so thank you for that. And the answer to your question, how so much I could put to the CV, um, I think the answer is very straightforward. If you happen to be born in a country which undergoes several transitions, democratic and undemocratic transitions, then life simply happens to you and you have to, ha have to go with the flow. So sometimes changes in your life and major changes in your CV are just um, adaptations to situations. And if you are lucky enough and probably work hard then you just end up in very interesting and, and, and great situations which you have never would have thought about when you just mm -hmm. was a student of law and back, you know, uh, 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 decades ago. So um, I think m my life and my career was uh, um, a series of luck <laughs> and, um, and, and lucky turns in that way. And um, the, the, the last turn of this luck was uh, moving to Vienna which I really, really appreciate that life showed this, um, this path to me and my family five years ago to, to come to this country and to this city and, um, and learn how this could be done differently in, in such a beautiful environment like, like this city 
we we really love a lot. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. thank you, Christina. We agreed that you would start with a short presentation to introduce us into the topic. So I would suggest that you simply yeah. start with this. Thank you. And um, and yes, I have uh, also a presentation to I have prepared um, for us to just a quick. Um, um, overview because um, I wish to, to give you um, today a brief overview on the state of play of media freedom in Europe uh, using the example of the uh, coronavirus pandemic affecting several aspects of media freedom across Europe. Um, having some very concrete examples, also country case like the Hungarian case, but also uh, uh, some uh, examples what, what are the types of attacks media freedom is under right now. And I really hope that this kind of overview will be um, a trigger to our further discussions today. So let me just um, start with this. Um, so the overview about the, the four pillars, usually we talk about four pillars of media freedom, which are press freedom, pluralism of the media, independence of the media, and safety of journalists. So these are the four pillars we consider when we kind of look at the, the, uh, the state of play of media freedom. The COVID situation, as I mentioned, the case in point in Hungary, and, and some critical reflections. Yeah. So... Let me start with um, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, the first point, we lawyers, uh, if our uh, male ident identity is a legal one, which is mine definitely, uh, is starting with, and these are the, the legal and, um, and, um, and, uh, and rights aspects of media freedom. And media freedom and pluralism are fundamental parts of the rights and the principles enshrined in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights and also in the European Charter on Human Rights. Media freedom in that sense as the fundamental basic um, uh, ground to, to, uh, um, to, uh, to several other freedoms in Europe, we can say that is systematically and, um, um, and severely under attack, both globally in, and both in democratic and non-democratic countries, but also in Europe and also within the European Union since many, many years. We can also say today that uh, media freedom uh, in several um, cases was seen and free media rather as an opponent uh, and not as a, as a fundamental aspect of a free society. And this was very often the case why media freedom came under attack since, uh, um, <clears throat> since uh, some years uh, ago. However, today in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, what we can see is that these attacks continue and that they have significant ramifications um, because the crisis presented a significant opportunity for further threats against media freedom. And the coronavirus emergency was very often used as a pretext and as a justification for the implementation of new draconian restrictions on free expression and as well to increase press censorship. Um, here to use the, the most important evidence to my statements here, I would uh, uh, suggest that we discuss the recently published rule of law report of the European Commission, which uh, was published um, end of September on the 30th of September. And this report very critically and very importantly covered at least five different aspects of um, uh, rule of law backsliding 
within the European Union, mentioning the independence of media regulatory authorities um, in many countries of Europe, mentioning the problems with regards to transparency of ownership in the media, as a matter of fact, uh, a huge, prob uh, a huge uh, um, uh, factor to threatening the pluralism of the media. The report was also covering the issue of uh, threats to the safety of journalists across Europe and in several countries. If we just recall the Malta case, I think this is something that rings a bell to many of us, but also Slovakia and the, the attack um, uh, against um, 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 the Slovak um, journalist, uh, I think one and a half years ago uh, was, was, a, was an um, extreme case of uh, showcasing um, these kind of threats against journalists. A very important aspect, especially to students of law and to lecturers um, and, and, um, and um, uh, uh, researchers in law, are the problems with regards to right of access to information and the repeated difficulties and obstacles to obtain information in several countries of Europe. And um, the another uh, aspect was uh, highlighted by the rule of law report was uh, the distorting impact of state advertising, and we will come back to this issue as an aspect distorting media pluralism in Europe. So these kind of European aspects are strongly and clearly related to the global um, uh, picture, and this is the global picture I have on the slide, um, um, used by the UNESCO report, the latest report on media freedom and trends in media freedom across Europe, and the threats uh, against the four pillars of media freedom. And let, uh, let us look a little bit um, uh, more focused on what the pandemic and what the coronavirus situation brought as a new kind of um, uh, uh, phenomena uh, to, to these threats. The coronavirus situation was not something that created um, something brand new to, 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 to the, to the, to the um, threats and to the situation of media freedom across Europe, but have strongly accelerated processes and, and backsliding in terms of uh, the freedom situation. Because the coronavirus pandemic highlighted the systemic weaknesses of media systems and the media freedom aspects. And, um, and these acceleration um, is becoming actually more and more problematic across all pillars of media freedom. These accelerations were very much attainable in terms of global restrictions on media freedom due to the pandemic or using the pandemic as a pretext there too. Um, the, phenomena of something that was called very often as the shock doctrine restrictions which could have not which would have not been impossible otherwise in normal times the disinfodemic phenomena which was undermining public trust across uh, many countries globally but also in Europe and also the economic aspects and the economic threats against media freedom and something that is um, already called as the media extinction event. And what are these um, uh, um, threats and, and accelerations? How do they look in more details? So when I'm saying that global restrictions on <clears throat> media freedom um, were accelerated, I am referring to several instances on these, of these um, um, attacks. They were reported by major international organizations like the Reporters Without Borders, 
like the International Press Institute, Council of Europe, but also the Media Players Monitor of the European Union already highlighted these kind of um, attacks and these kind of restrictions. And let me share with you. Um, can you see now my screen? We see we see the slide, Christina, not okay. your screen. Okay. Then you need to just... stop the sharing and share the other okay. window, probably. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So this is, for example, the International Press Institute, which has recorded over 400. 26 instances since basically March um, 2020, so basically spring of this year. So over 400 instances of media freedom violations across the world. And what are these instances and which um, areas of the global were affected by? Arrests and charges of journalists. Um, these instances were very much reported in the Asia Pacific region, but as you see, Europe was also hardly affected by this. So basically journalists were under arrest, under charges, because they were doing their job. And in many countries, they were treated by legal restrictions as scaremongers, and they were put under usually criminal charges because they were doing the job and they were reporting about public health situations. And this is one of the major um, uh, uh, attacks in terms of legal restrictions against media freedom and against freedom of expression. But it's also a huge aspect threatening the safety of journalists because, it, because these people were subject of criminal cases in many countries across the world, as you can see, but also in Europe included. And other aspect of these restrictions were on access to information, very often in form of legal restrictions. So basically, journalists and media were not allowed to get access to um, uh, public health record, public health data, because laws were put in place in several countries that hindered this access uh, um, for, for uh, reporting purposes. But also in many cases, these restrictions were in form of de facto restrictions. So basically they were denied to get access to those information that otherwise legally would have been accessible for the public. Again, here, Asia Pacific region was mostly and uh, um, hardly hit by the Europe region. Um, and this, and this uh, report was talking about the European region, um, also beyond the, the, the borders of the European Union, but the bigger region was meant here. So for example, uh, Southern Europe um, um, uh, counts to, to, the, to the European region in that sense. Censorship was a major impact. And here Europe, Europe was an understand, uh, outstander, I would say. So that's, uh, that's also one of the, the major attacks in that sense. And here again, legal restrictions in forms of, um, of uh, censorship measurements were a very important factor restricting media freedom. Excessive fake news regulation. Um, beautiful laws were enacted in several countries. Um, basically threatening uh, the media being um, becoming uh, um, spreaders of fake news uh, while actually they were not doing anything as but for example questioning public reporting and public data on the public health situation in a given country and very often verbal and physical attacks against journalists was a huge phenomenon since the, the outbreak of the pandemic. So these restrictions, again, not only Europe, but as you can see here, very, very uh, importantly, also in Europe, there are major problems and major attacks um, against media freedom. 
So let us get back to other instances. So this was the International Press Institute. The reporters um, without borders, they, they also um, showcased several similar um, attacks. And let me also mention here the Council of Europe report, which signaled across 30 countries of Europe, already 150 alerts as threats and attacks against journalists. So media, the, the people who work in the media in several ways and in, in several um, uh, aspects. All these restrictions were basically threatening at least three pillars of media freedom, the press freedom pillar, the pluralism um, pillar and the safety pillar. The shock doctrine, um, which I have mentioned as, as, um, as also one of the uh, very typical um, attacks against media freedom. Very often authoritarian governments across the globe, but also within Europe, took the advantage of exceptional circumstances of, of the pandemic and imposed new measures that would have been impossible in other times. And they have legitimated laws and new regulations that were put in place. For example, as, for example, as attacks on journalists and police intimidation very often of journalists and also uh, political attacks on journalists. And these shock doctrine type of restrictions were again very often and very typically threatening major pillars of media freedom, the pluralist pillar, the independence pillar very, uh, very often, because um, the, um, the attacks against the, um, the political attacks, for example, typically against journalists undermine public trust in the media, which is a very important aspect of independence of the media. And obviously the safety of journalists, again, uh, was a question here. Let me also briefly discuss the, the question about the disinfodemic that was undermining public trust and how this affected the media freedom situation. Many sources and many uh, research that was already in, um, put in place since the, since the outbreak of the, uh, of the pandemic was talking about toxic disinfodemic uh, of disinformation and misinformation, which basically disempowered um, uh, um, citizens all across Europe, but all, uh, and also globally, endangered life, lives of many and led to confusion of many people. I have a few examples for me to, um, to mention here. For example, an analysis of 112 million, 112 million, sorry to repeat, public social media posts across 64 languages that were related to, to the pandemic. So the analysis of these public social media posts found that 40% came from unreliable sources. These, these numbers, these revealings uh, led many scholars and many researchers coming to, 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 to the description of the situation as a toxic disinfodemic um, uh, state of the media. Also another research that was uh, put in place during the summer um, focusing on Twitter and focusing on tweets, actually looking at 178 million tweets found that, again, more than 42% of the tweets were produced by bots, and 40% of them were also looked at, uh, were being unreliable in that sense. And the la last revealing here was, um, uh, I think, yes, it was the Reuters Institute, who were looking at social media users, so the user's perspective, and they found that at least one third of uh, social media users reported seeing false or misleading information about the coronavirus. So the volume, the intensity 
of misinformation and disinformation and the combination of, of this toxic uh, misleading environment with very often, uh, very often with emotional content and also very often with racist, xenophobic content and with hate speech led to a situation where, where we could definitely say that globally and also in Europe, um, the, the social media environment became one of the biggest threats to, to media freedom um, uh, as, as it stands today and as it stands um, uh, right now. We also have to mention that most um, social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Google, LinkedIn, I just to mention a few, they have um, committed themselves somewhere in the very beginning of the, of the European situation. So around the middle of March and in a joint statement made a, a commitment to fight the coronavirus related misinformation. And they put actually a lot of measurements in place in terms of content moderation, fact checkers, fact checkers, um, several attempts directing users towards um, official health information instead of misleading information. And, um, and for example, they put also in place advertising policies that banned advertisements that included uh, COVID related disinformation. We can come back also this aspect, this aspect later on. And, um, and the latest uh, and the last um, example I, I wanted to, to mention here about the economic aspects, because um, um, a free media cannot function if its funding is not stable and, it, and if its funding is not uh, um, adequate and if it's not, if it's not enabling independence of the media. And here across the globe, but uh, again within uh, Europe also, we have to. We have to. Uh, the media has been uh, um, faced with um, the economic stress of the crisis, pushing many media organizations to the brink of extinction, exactly at the moment when they were most needed. Um, the overall and general context of the pandemic leading to a worst economic recession since the Great Depression, and this is not my quote here, but the quote from the International Monetary Fund, but also the International Labour Organization expected the loss of the equivalent of 200 million full-time jobs across the globe. These contexts translated to the media organizations, which have been hit very hardly, um, ended up in a situation where, where, for example, advertising revenue declined since the outbreak of the pan pandemic, in many cases, to 70%. 70%. So basically, two thirds of the income of independent media was just away. Most dramatically, um, if I might use these very emotional words, local and regional media, for example, community radios. So small media outlets that are the fundamental uh, players um, enabling media pluralism and plurality of the media market were the most hardly hit. In the UK, one third of community ra radio stations were at the risk of closure already by the end of the summer. And as we see, the pandemic is just going on. Here, another aspect I, I wish to, to mention is that this decline in advertising in, um, income and, uh, and advertising revenues was paralleled that meanwhile, some and these are the major US-based tech giants, the social media platforms. Actually, they were the winners of this situation in many um, aspects. We have very few first results in terms of who took the money out from whose pocket. 
if you wish to, uh, to, to put it in this way. But this slide and this data I put here can show you that why traditional media and, and in Europe we are talking about the traditional media, television, radio, print and online press were the biggest uh, losers of this situation. In certain cases, as I said, even up to 70% of revenue losses. But on the other hand, social media, online video platforms and, um, and, uh, and for example, search um, uh, engines like Google, they did, they made some um, uh, low, um, gains uh, even in this situation. And I think this is also a very important uh, aspect we need to discuss with regards to European situation. And now a few words on, um, on a country that is in many cases uh, um, um, became the worst case example within Europe to media freedom declaration. Unfortunately, my home country. So Hungary was also one of the uh, one of the cases that really showcased uh, within the um, within the pandemic situation how the several also otherwise very problematic situation with regards to media freedom could have be even could have become even worse. So the press freedom aspect. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, Hungary enacted a new law that was called the Authorization Act and, um, and some other laws against scaremongering. And these laws were strictly restrict, uh, these, were, these laws were restricting free media and media uh, uh, reporting. And their legal analysis already pointed out that all these laws were clearly against constitutional and international legal standards on media freedom and freedom of expression. However, no one declared these legal acts as being such um, um, in breaches of, um, of international legal standards. And because Hungary again declared the state of emergency within the country, these legal acts will become, and, um, and these restrictions will become again, very important uh, within the Hungarian context as of yesterday. Actually, yeah, as of yesterday. Independence, the independence aspect. Um, media outlets in Hungary reported by the summer already up to 25 cutbacks in terms of jobs. So they had to leave the very few independent media outlets, they had to let off journalists up to one fourth of their staff because they could not pay salaries. They could not afford anymore to, to, um, to maintain their jobs. Um, and that happened already by the summer and who knows how long this situation is going to go on. So um, who knows how, how this is going to, to, to to be extended, but no one is, expects any better case scenarios, actually. The, pre, the plural is um, pillar of media freedom. The Hungarian government very often attacked um, and pro-media, pro-government media in Hungary very often attacked the credibility of uh, critical media coverage. So basically the government itself, but also the, the huge amount of pro-media outlets put other journalists, other media outlets who were criticizing and questioning the reliability of government data and government's public information about how many people got sick, how many people died. And those outlets and those journalists who were, who were critical around these very important questions they were attacked and they were very often threatened also by legal acts as, uh, as scaremongers uh, within the Hungarian society. And these led obviously to the situation where the safety of these journalists was also very often under attack and journalists reported that their 
they were very often intimidated since the outbreak of the um, of the uh, pandemic, and uh, and their work was very often um, attacked, both physically in terms of they were not, for example, they were not allowed to attend press conferences. So these kind of uh, restrictions and these kind of attacks were were already put in place but also um, being called as spreaders of fake news very often. And um, I think the Hungarian case is a kind of straightforward in illustration of the direct effects of the current pandemic crisis situation to the overall vulnerable media, con in an um, uh, overall vulnerable media context and how worse it could have even uh, be. Uh, be. So let me just sum up here. Um, what we see is today globally, but also in Europe and also within the European Union, the complexity of systemic deteriorations of media freedom accelerated by the pandemic situation and this situation ended up in a technological crisis uh, in many ways due to the lack of democratic guarantees and democratic legal guarantees, for example, with regards to the oversight of social media platforms. It ended up also in a democratic crisis due to polarization and repressive policies, a crisis of trust due to suspicion and even hatred against free media, and also in uh, an economic crisis, empowering, empowering quality journalism. And these systemic and complex uh, converging crisis uh, situation um, was combined, compounded by the global public health uh, crisis situation. Today, media is very often used, which was used to be the part of the solution to very grave social problems and um, and and national uh, and national healthcare problems like a, 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 a public health crisis. Now, today, media is rather the part of the problem as the solution there too. So. This was basically um, the kind of the, the, the picture I wish to, to share with you and with the audience about uh, how um, this uh, media freedom crisis uh, <clears throat> just uh, uh, extended and, and, um, and was um, um, rolling over across Europe and in many countries. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. So, thank you so much, Christina, for that first part. Um, if it were in an auditorium, everyone would applaud now. Unfortunately, <laughs> we can't you. hear this. The, so I, I need to do it symbolically. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, if, if I may, I would like to ask several questions to you. Um, and yes, some please. of them are very basic. Some of them are probably more complex. So the, the most basic question I have is, one of the problems that I see um, in Hungary is the fact that it's a very uh, complex language and that very few people uh, don't speak Hungarian. Yeah. So that it is very difficult for non-Hungarians to fully get a picture of what's happening in the country. So the, the, the basic question I would have therefore, is there any source, any website, any, I don't know, journal, whatever <laughs> that you would recommend as the best possible uh, uh, source of information about the situation uh, when it comes to the media um, in the country. Yes, um, thank you so much. This is one of the, as you said, one of the biggest problems and um, some uh, critical media outlets, also media watchdogs, uh, the very few independent ones realized this and started to report also in English about the most uh, important revealings um, sometimes publishing also reports in um, 
in English, I would definitely turn your attention to, and I'm happy to, sh uh, to send you the links after, after our discussion, because otherwise, if I say the Hungarian names, they are very <laughs> complicated <laughs> to, you know, to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, record. But uh, so Mirtek, uh, which mm -hmm. is an independent um, uh, NGO and watchdog and who are doing wonderful reports and, um, and, um, and analysis about the the most severe attacks against media freedom in Hungary. They have several reports published also in English. I would definitely um, uh, mention um, uh, an independent um, investigative journalist group called um, 360. It's kind of uh, easier to, um, uh, sorry, 36. It's then in that 360, it's uh, 36. Um, lately, the latest, uh, revealing they made, uh, I think that would be something very, very important to, to discuss, was about how, how German, how German politics and how German industry basically backing up Orban and the Hungarian government mm -hmm. and uh, basically helping for more than 10 years within the European Union, the Hungarian government basically get away and to survive all, all the critics, all the issues against the, the attacks of the rule of law and, and, um, and decline and deterioration of uh, democratic freedoms. And this journalist group made a, a real wonderful investigative journalist project on looking behind these um, 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 very important and very uh, grave revelations how for example, the German uh, car industry is very much interested in uh, keeping Orban alive. Let's put me in this way. And why they have a very important interest to, to, to let Orban get away with this. But also I would mention Atlatso. So there are a few ones and I'm happy to, to share this. But as you said, yes, this is a very important problem. And, um, and it's very hard very often even to explain to colleagues what is going on in Hungary. And I remember mm -hmm. my first years after the 2010 undemocratic turn in Hungary, trying to explain to colleagues, um, for example, living in the UK or other parts of Europe, what was going on in Hungary. And at some point I realized that they were looking at me like me being the weird one. Because, you know, they said, mm -hmm. no, this can't be. The, the things I was talking about mm -hmm. were, were so unbelievable and unimaginable how attacks against rule of law can happen within the European Union at such gravity, at such volume, and against all pillars of a democratic legal system, for example. So how can you put under attack all independent uh, authorities, um, all the, the judiciary, um, the, the media, the state um, uh, prosecutors, how can you, constitutional court, obviously, so how could this all happen once? And it, it could have happened. And since then, 10 years went by. But again, it's, very, it's, uh, it's not easy to, to get a full picture if, if you don't speak this very complicated mm -hmm. question, uh, uh, the language of Hungary. Yeah. Could you perhaps also comment a little bit about the role of the European Union um, and <laughs> in how far in particular uh, institutions like the European Commission are in, you, in your view successfully in monitoring, are successful in monitoring what's happening and in assessing this and in criticizing this or is yeah. there room for improvement and if so how would that look like? Um, thank you for the question again. Um, I'm not a political scientist. But, um, but, I but a lawyer, to, and I mean, there are some legal standards here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let me put it this way. In 2010, we had a lot of hopes, we Hungarians, and we who were raised and born, at least with the hope of, um, of, of a country based on democratic values and based on the rule of law. So in 2010, we really had huge hopes that, you know, the European Union is there and there could have not been something like that happening, like overtaking 
um, uh, free media and uh, and threatening um, and um, and threatening of uh, of media outlets, but but all these um, democ- rule of law, uh, rule of law backsliding. It turned out that on the one hand, the European Union as such and the European Commission uh, especially was claiming in very often the lack of competences in terms, in legal terms that they were not able to act upon uh, very ca- in many cases, for example, uh, in, in aspects of media pluralism. There, was, there were many, many discussions and legal debates, um, not even discourses, but debates and, and, and very hot um, uh, uh, debates on this, whether the European uh, Commission should have used competencies, for example, that are um, enshrined in the fundamental charter. And I would say that the legal opinions are differing, whether the European Commission could have done more or not in these terms, but the political will, and this is why, for example, these kind of revelations, why German politics was not in favor of using even those competencies and even those legal means that were in the hand of the European Commission uh, against the rule of law backsliding. from the legal point of view, something we, um, we need to um, refer to here um, is the so-called Copenhagen dilemma. And the, the Hungarian case was a very good example to this because the Copenhagen dilemma is about how the European Union functions. And once you want, wish to join the, the community, the, the union, so if in, in, um, in accession countries like Serbia, let me give you this example. Serbia wishes to join the European Union. The European Union is in the position up until you join the Union, union to, to give very, very strict and harsh critique if the applicant country, so if the, 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 acces- uh, the country which wish to uh, acce- uh, assess, uh, access um, the, the, uh, the Union is not meeting for example, rule of law criteria or media freedom criteria. But once you are within the community, and this is the Copenhagen dilemma, these competencies are far less and much, much more weaker. So these kind of double standards, I would call, became a huge um, um, aspect of, uh, of constitutional lawyers' discussions around the rule of law mechanism um, mm-hmm. within the European Union and what you could have in place in such situations. Mm-hmm. One of our readers refers me to the following uh, uh, writing, the following, regarding your question about Hungary and EU, yesterday, yesterday a new linkage to the rule of law was approved that may sanction, sanction Hungary in the future by cutting their budget funds. It still needs to pass, but since it was already discussed between them, there's a 99% chance it will eventually pass. Uh, so <laughs> two aspects here. First one is budget the right instrument, um, yeah. in your view? And second, is it plausible that this will happen? Yeah, um, thank you for mentioning this. I was trying to follow this news at 6 a.m. this morning, so I won't say that I'm absolutely um, im- imbilder, <laughs> I would say, uh, about this. Uh, but this, this case is really a beautiful um, example how the different, differing political objectives and the differing political aims of the different uh, um, European Union institutions. So for example, here there's a huge decline, uh, division between the European Commission, the European Council, um, um, uh, the Council of uh, the European Council and the European Parliament. The European Parliament is in favor of more stricter rule of law restrictions and rule of law uh, standards used uh, once the COVID extra budget funds would be um, 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 uh, shared among the countries, while the council where you have Hungary, where you have Poland, where you have other major countries in breach of rule of law, 
um, <clears throat> who are against this. So this is a very much political fight within, with, uh, among these um, um, bodies, uh, among these institutions, and among these uh, uh, political wills. I wish that um, your uh, commentator had right and 99% it would end up restricting uh, COVID funds to, to, to Hungary or to, to Poland. I'm not sure that this is going to happen. And, and saying this as a Hungarian citizen, it's, um, it's, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, I would really wish the European community kind of punishing, you know, breaches of rule of law. But if the answer is that people living in the country, my family, my, um, my friends, or, 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 or people who really need, for example, those funds coming from, from the European budget, the European Union's budget, they will be the ones cut off from mm. this money. So it's, um, you know, it's, um, it's very hard to say that I wish this to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. My legal, uh, my, uh, <clears throat> you know, my lawyer soul would wish to see that. My, uh, my, um, uh, my personal uh, views are, are more, more um, com um, I mean, more uh, uh, complex on this. Yeah. I but thank you for it. thank you for this because I think this is a re really uh, a good example to to this question. Yeah, may I perhaps also ask a third question about the Hungarian situation now, a more specific one, which is about uh, the report of the uh, reporter Sans Frontières that you were mm -hmm. mentioning. So I I read this in preparation of today, and one of the interesting uh, quotes that I would like or, or statements that I would like to quote here is the following: Access to information is more and more difficult for independent journalists. They are banned from freely asking politicians in the parliament or from attending different events. Government politicians do not give interviews to governmental critical media outlets. Press departments of public institutions typically do not reply to questions of independent media. Uh, so the question I have now to you as a lawyer, uh, how could that be changed? I mean, this is something which is, I mean, purely politics in a sense, right? And the question I would have is how, how, what, 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 what can a legal, even if one wanted to change this as a legal system, so even if you woke up tomorrow being the legal system of Hungary, right? How could you then, how could you push people and politicians, politicians in power in particular to answer questions? And is this really something that is worth being, um, uh, reported or worth being criticized? Um, yes and no is the answer. So let me give you here a very, um, I think, wonderful example, m m not because of me, but because the people who are doing. There is um, uh, one of the very few independent media outlets uh, called Atlas Open to. Um, they, it's, um, in English, it would be transparent.au, that's mm -hmm. their name. It's an um, independent um, media portal focusing on revelations, uh, corruption, heavy corruption, um, but also they were the ones who revealed how government um, officials were basically breaching their own laws under, uh, during the lockdown situation. So, so many, many important revelations. This media portal is working with um, a dedicated, talented legal team of young lawyers, very often um, um, law students. And they have several strategic cases at the courts, taking very taken uh, very often to, to the Strasbourg court and won very often those cases to basically um, uh, push politicians, push the government and to oblige them to, to provide to, uh, access to to critical and, and meaningful information. And um, the, the Atlazo team, so the, the legal team, they really won very, very important um, 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 cornerstone and groundbreaking cases, cases that were already taken advantage in other countries. Because for example, when the Strasbourg court 
came up um, uh, with the uh, with the um, idea that um, that um, um, uh, media freedom and um, and and public um, um, and disclosure and the right of access to public information is part of freedom of expression as a legal, you know, as a legal right. That was a very important and major case that was referred and relied upon in many other European countries. Um, and that, that was the achievement of this legal team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me add, if I may, uh, that our reader or listener just added to the, to the question before that the proposal states that it would make sure that it won't affect the people itself. Um, so there is a press release clearly stating that if the budget restriction should happen, uh, it should not affect the, the, the people. But probably, I mean, it's easy to write this down. Yes. It's more complicated <laughs> than to guarantee yeah. this, right? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Perhaps back, coming back to the transparency part again, um, um, I would, if you will, if you agree, I would be very happy to hear from you um, a little bit of an assessment about how Austria is doing in comparison. Because one of the criticisms that you constantly hear in Austrian politics, as you certainly are very much aware of, is that also Austrian politicians are very reluctant in speaking to critical media, some mm -hmm. of them at least. Um, and we are also very reluctant in this country in, in, in producing a, a law on yes. freedom <laughs> of access to information. So is this just a stupidity or laziness or is it, <laughs> is it more than this in your view? Um, thank you for this question because I was giving thoughts about this <laughs> already. Um, I, I was like uh, a little bit shocked when I first realized that Austria does not have in place a proper uh, access to information now, right? Because this, mm -hmm. is the, this is the legal situation in Austria. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I was very, very much... Uh, um, surprised first and then since then I'm also giving thoughts how for example the current government is not addressing this issue and how for example the current um, uh, Ministry of Justice is not uh, putting this issue forward. Uh, I think you know the Has im Netz Gesetz and forth mm -hmm. is also an extremely important thing to put forward the judicial reform and I really really I'm a big supporter or fan of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Alma Zadic in that sense, but the, the freedom of uh, uh, um, information um, law, having this as a, a, according to international standards, I think it's a critical uh, question here. Here, my thoughts would be, you know, Austria is also, I think, um, a wonderful example that um, um, single lawyers, sometimes law students, and here I'm, I'm, I'm referring to Max Schrems, can make huge changes when they are systemically and strategically attacking legal systems and legal institutions. And I think here, a beautiful collaboration, for example, with the lawyers who were uh, putting these cases and, and bringing these um, um, public um, access to information cases to the Strasbourg court, here a beautiful cooperation with, uh, with Austrian lawyers who who have this kind of agenda as a strategic uh, uh, litigation, as we call it, um, there could be a lot to learn and a lot to, to done, for example, together. If, for example, such a case when a, an Austrian politician is denying access to information could be taken to the courts and maybe also to, to the Strasbourg court later on. But this mm. is just an idea for me. I, I, I would be very happy to get involved in such a you know, case. <laughs> yeah. I think that would be a wonderful um, uh, opportunity to, to test you know, the boundaries of, uh, of the legal system. Yeah, uh, very last question, if I may, in this field, and then perhaps we, if you agree, go to the gender aspects, uh, which we haven't covered yet. Uh, so last question to this field, in my view, would be the following. You were very positive now about the Hasim Netzgesetz hate, hate in the, on the internet law uh, proposal, as it is suggested at the moment here in Austria. Yes. Um, uh, on, on the one hand. On the other hand, you were referring to one of the, the critical issues when it comes to uh, freedom of the press or freedom of the media, that there is some kind of overblocking um, or overinterpretation happening when it comes to hate crime uh, or, or, or fake news. You, you were explicitly referring to fake news. 
on the internet. Um, yeah. um, and in my view, this is a very, very problematic uh, issue uh, because yeah. uh, what we see uh, in all this, at, in particular today, when we try to follow what's happening in the US, um, it is, it is what I see here in Taelia is that institutions like Facebook and Twitter and Google suddenly end up in, in, in the role that they need to assess in, in very, very short time whether or not something that is coming from the from the president of the United States is misleading, right? So, yeah. uh, and and this is a situation which I would not want <laughs> a, a platform to be in for obvious reasons, right? And in particular here now also for freedom of the of information reasons, because I want me to decide on whether I see something yeah. uh, or not, and not um, yeah. a platform. And uh, wouldn't you agree that this uh, uh, Hasim Netz uh, law, um, I mean, of course it's not, it's something very different, but in the tendency, wouldn't you agree that it also has this problem in, enshrined in, in the very design of the law, which is that platforms need to end up in assessing whether or not content is justifiable in extremely short time? And in extreme amounts, you were referring to, I don't know, 120 million yeah. tweets or something. Yeah, in 24 hours or even less. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, let me try to put my position here um, more um, uh, uh, clearer then. And maybe that could be a, a next discussion we could have on, on these aspects. Uh, I think this trend, as you mentioned, is clearly a trend. I. I refer very often as privatization of censorship mm -hmm. and the trend basically outsourcing law enforcement to private institutions. Mm -hmm. And yes, I, I absolutely agree that the mechanism that is included in the Hasim, Gazette, Hasim Nets uh, Gazette and forth, but obviously also the one that is the um, Nets DG, which was mm -hmm. the, the example here is uh, following, uh, uh, both are, of them are following this trend of uh, pushing the burden of speech regulation to private entities instead of you, instead of me, and instead of the judiciary. And this is a very, very problematic trend. I absolutely agree with this. And, uh, and this is something I definitely refer as a major threat to democratic control of, of speech and of spe free speech. Why I said that I am thinking to some extent positively about the Hasim Nets uh, um, um, uh, uh, proposal, yes. because I think on the other hand, it is a step towards some public oversight about the platforms, giving the right to the media regulator, the um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the ATA GmbH, basically, so the, the Comastria uh, and the ATA to to oversee what is going on in terms of privatized speech regulation. And this step, I very much appreciate of this uh, of this um, <clears throat> uh, of this uh, 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 legal proposal. And also, on the other hand. I very much appreciate the, the parts of the proposal on the better enforcement of legal, the, the le better legal enforcement mm -hmm. in terms of, um, 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 you, remember, you, you much better know than me how hard it was, um, um, <clears throat> for example, for um, um, uh, doing the, the, the Glavishnik case and how much um, hard it was to, to, to bring Facebook and push Facebook to, um, uh, to, to, to basically implement and enforce the law. So I am in favor of the law, uh, the, the, the draft law and other draft laws across Europe or the world, which are making steps towards more public oversight and more public scrutiny over platforms, uh, operations, let's put this way. But I'm very much against the trend, basically saying that 
if you guys, if you Twitter, if you Facebook, you just, you know, get rid of the lot of wrong hate speech, the lot of disinformation, whatever, then we are happy. We politicians are happy. I think this is a very, very wrong trend on the other hand. So mm-hmm. I see these um, parallels and I see these competing, you know, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, objectives in that sense, some of which I'm in favor of, some of which I'm very critical about. Yeah, I, I fully understand this. And uh, I, I would have plenty of other questions on this, uh, but but I think <laughs> probably uh, ne- the uh, next next discussion. Yeah, we, sh- we, we should probably continue if you <laughs> if you agree with the gender related aspects, Christina. So yes. the question I um, I have to you is, I mean, the, the picture that you drew at the beginning in particular was already very gray uh, or even black, I would say. <laughs> uh, and and I, I, I don't know. Sorry about that. that. There is a darker color than black, but I would expect to see a darker color than black when it comes to how uh, women uh, do in this um, area. And, and perhaps you would like to give us a little bit more yeah. information on this. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> here I would use a very Austrian um, 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 uh, research revealing, um, I think, which could be um, um, probably a good discussion to discuss it. So first of all, media freedom is gendered. And this is a very important um, um, starting point we have to consider all pillars of media freedom, whether the press freedom aspect, whether the, the independence, the, the, the plural aspect is especially, but also the safety, they all have gendered aspects. What do I mean by that? For, for example, let me give you the example. We talked about the safety of journalists. Female journalists, especially within the, um, the all digital online environment are very often under much bigger and much more threats than their male colleagues. So the safety aspect and safety pillar of the of the media freedom is one of the, the, the most gendered aspects in terms of women are very often more subjects and targets are, of intimidation than men are, or male journalists are. Um, maybe um, 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 the, the, the life threats uh, uh, with regards to the life threats, like if you, if you think about global numbers or figures, um, um, sometimes men are m- much more often killed, but for example, uh, women journalists are much more often um, um, put under so-called shit storms uh, in social media if they do their job and report on, on, on public, uh, uh, issues of public interest. Um, the media pluralism aspect, is the, the most um, uh, uh, important um, in terms of gender equality and inequality. And here, let me try to example this with, um, uh, with um, a research we have done with students um, um, together. Uh, I'm trying to... You can see it, it's fine. Okay, okay, then it. fine. So. This is, a, <clears throat> this is a, a report that was published um, uh, mid of July um, with a Forschungspraxis um, 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 uh, class of, of mine. Um, we had obviously struggling with the, the, the pandemic situation and the, the lockdown, the first lockdown during the spring. And we come up with this class that we joined a very important and the only global research project, the so-called Gender Media Monitoring Project. And we did a pilot study on the Austrian online media during, with this class, during the, uh, the, the months of May and June. And we have reported about this. And um, you have, you could have a look at the, the, um, the German, version that was um, that was published in in the 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 Univin and um, um, the Univin Falter um, think tank blog where I was um, um, writing this in in uh, uh, Zusammenfassung in German about this report but uh, but um, uh, on this teaching blog 
the Let's Talk Equal blog, which is um, which is um, um, a, a blog that is maintained by by my by students and and by me, and where we are reporting about our research findings that we do uh, throughout our, our classes. So this. Basically, this work is, I think, um, <clears throat> an answer to how the picture of, um, of media pluralism and what the gender aspects are look like. So what we were looking at um, during the, um, um, during the um, spring, see, um, spring um, uh, months uh, was three, no, actually one, two, five, four, sorry, four Austrian media outlets online outlets, Krone AT, Kurier AT, Der Standard AT and ORF AT. And we have analyzed on a single monitoring day, which was the 7th of May, 52 internet news reportings. These, we have also observed Twitter news reporting and Twitter accounts of these media outlets and assessed 50 tweets that were published on the same day. And we used the method uh, of the monitoring and coding of the global monitoring project, which is, as I mentioned, the, 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 the only global um, <clears throat> research on, on gender and gender equality in the media and by the media. And what we have found, what we have found was somewhat positive in terms of um, um, more plurality within the Austrian media outlets, because we have confirmed that, for example, the number of female reporters in internet news, so women working in Austrian media, increased since 2015, which was the latest um, um, day of, um, of this um, uh, global uh, monitor uh, monitoring um, data survey, and it increased to 16% to 33%. So what does that mean in numbers? It means that um, in 2015, only 15% of all reporters working in, uh, in online media outlets uh, across the Austrian media were women, which in five years made a huge step forward and came up to one third of these media workforce. Obviously, this is also far from equality in in the, uh, in the uh, online media outlets. So it's definitely, um, <clears throat> uh, there is huge room for, for um, improvement, but it, this was um, a very important and encouraging um, um, uh, revelation of our research. Also a huge um, um, uh, revelation was that people as spokespersons talking to the media, so women who were speaking um, uh, in the media and, and to the media, the numbers here uh, uh, increased also from 16% to 31%. Uh, uh, so basically, this was also a very important media pluralism aspect that you could see more women talking in the news and asked and, and, and reported about. So first, we were very optimistic and we were very happy about these revelations. But once we started to look behind these figures that <clears throat> we had to recognize that actually these results were not that much um, encouraging as we have thought of, uh, uh, at the first time. Because it turned out that although it, more women came to um, uh, um, Came, uh, they, they, they were more often um, um, reported as, as, speak, uh, as speakers and speaking to the media. So they more often come to uh, word <laughs> in German, as you would say. But actually, they were still only in Nebenrolle in the news, mm -hmm. as we, we called it. So the only... Uh, 13% um, in internet news stories and only in 10% of Twitter news, women played a central role. So basically they were just, you know, mentioned, but they were not the ones who were really um, um, <clears throat> uh, playing an important part there. And more interestingly, we had to realize that behind this 
kind of positive trends, it was not Austrian media that was changed, that has changed in a positive way, but it was Austrian politics which did. So what was the reasons behind this uh, <clears throat> uh, um, raising numbers? The, the very profound reason was that the current government, <clears throat> there is gender parity in the current government of Austria. There is a 53% Frauen Anteil and, uh, and also in the, 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 the gender gap, also in the Nationalrat uh, was also closing um, since the, the new government uh, was in place and, and the new uh, parliament was in place. Which meant that obviously when um, uh, media was reporting and it was, you know, it was the, 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 the months of the, the first lockdown, so usually it was the government and government people spoke to the media because it was also the news were heavily overwhelmed with government reportings. There were more female politicians came to work. And the increase in numbers in that sense was not because media became more gender sensitive, but because there were more female politicians who, to, to be asked, which was a very encouraging and very important improvement in terms of Austrian politics, but it was a less encouraging improvement in terms of Austrian media, uh, the, the, the Austrian media industry or the, media, uh, the Austrian media reporting. Unfortunately, we further looked into uh, the details and um, we had to, we had to um, um, realize that, for example, the very important aspects of, for example, the pandemic, how many um, families, how many women were hardly hit. And you remember those were the days when there were no schools, there were no kindergarten and families were start struggling at homes and mostly women and, uh, and, uh, and, and mothers were, uh, uh, were for, first and foremost struggling in Austria, but all across the world to juggle between working from home, learning with the kids, doing everything at the same time. So, so in that sense, the, the, the spring um, season was even more problematic, but <clears throat> these aspects were not really uh, reported in the Austria. And we have found, for example, that um, only 4%, um, 4% of internet news and only 2% of Twitter stories highlighted the issues of gender equality and none of the stories challenged gender stereotypes. And I think this was a very, very uh, problematic revealing. Mm -hmm. uh, last mentioning here, we looked at the very specific question, uh, especially in the German speaking word, the gender sensitive views of language. Uh, so the gender neutrale Sprache. We have found that uh, Austrian media mostly failed to, to use gender sensitive language, especially on Twitter, where only about three of 25 tweets were gendered, even those that were published, for example, by the ORF. And I think that that was a very, uh, very problematic revealing. So, if we talk about media freedom and if we talk about media pluralism, the picture is, um, is complex. There are some encouraging developments in, in here, here, but uh, if you look into the details, if you look behind the, these um, numbers and figures, you see, still see very, very problematic aspects in terms of um, gender equality and media freedom. Mm -hmm. Let me, if I may, share a, more an anecdote with you than, than, than a question. Uh, the anecdote is the following. Um, you, you, you certainly saw, just like I did, I think it was last week, the, pre the last press conference of the, of the Austrian government about uh, what we might expect in the second lockdown. Um, and as usual in these press conferences, it was ma men only speaking. In this case, it was five members of the, of the government, all of them male. Um, before that, it was four, all of them male. So it's always the chancellor, the vice chancellor. Yeah. Then we have the minister of health and the minister of interior 
of the interior and now on top of this um, the minister of finance uh, and I, I, <laughs> I allowed myself uh, to put this on Twitter as a comment okay. yeah, that it's uh, five males again. And, and interestingly, uh, I was quite intensely criticized for this by a young woman. <laughs> so um, so um, th that's just an anecdote. Uh, uh, the first, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not just an anecdote because I think it's an extremely important case. And let me let us um, uh, take this anecdote further. Um, please recall the pictures of Monday evening mm -hmm. and uh, the terror attacks. And it was, you know, this week mm -hmm. it was, uh, uh, <clears throat> we just discussed yesterday at, uh, uh, with, the uh, with my class. And here I will also come back to this issue that a young woman criticized you. So it was an awful night, right? For, uh, for all over of us and for, um, for everybody. Um, interestingly, um, my daughters, for example, who have no idea where to switch on a television, even they were sitting with us, you know, on the couch watching the television, because in times of crisis, the good old fanzian comes, um, comes to play very often. And this is what we, we did. And we were obviously watching ZIP and watching ORF, mostly sometimes we were switching to um, Puls uh, 24. So you were looking at uh, OER offensive and obviously they did an amazing job, you know, to report and, and how they, so they started with Armin Wolf and then the, the next uh, anchor uh, persons took over. But what have we, ha have se we seen? We have seen male politicians on Nehammer. There was not even the chance to that, for example, the Justiz Ministerin could have mm -hmm. come to what, why not? Mm -hmm. I, I was extremely surprised about this during the whole day and also on Tuesday when they mm -hmm. were making these uh, special conferences and, 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 and because the, the, de, the uh, uh, de-radicalization program that was put under attack by, you know, the, the day one, uh, day, uh, minute one, uh, because of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the attacker who was uh, uh, subject to this program. So it would have been also from the journalistic point of view, obvious to, 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 to ask also the, the the, the, the Mr. Uh, Justice Minister. So we have seen male politicians. We have seen three male uh, anchor person of ORF mm. doing a, a, obviously a great job, but uh, no one else. You, we have seen only male correspondents across the different points of Vienna. And we have seen only, only male um, uh, uh, um, um, Augenzeuge mm -hmm. yeah. speaking to the reporters. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I've asked the, the, this question uh, 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 yesterday uh, with my class. And the answer was uh, not straightforward, whether it was uh, you know, good or bad, uh, uh, how it happened. But many, of, many of, uh, uh, of the students said, this is how it should be because it has to be, you know, it has to be straightforward, it has to be neutral and it has to be fact-based. So the reporting should be as it is. If it happened that it's uh, men who, who were there, then they should do the job. And there were basically only one student who has mentioned the aspect that she, she would have very much, obviously it was a she, she would have very much appreciated it if, if, for example, more emotions maybe compassion would have been seen because it was a night, it was a day where many people were in shock and maybe it would have helped that to see that others were also personally, you know, affected by, by the, 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 the events of the, of the night. And, uh, and, Probably it's a cliche. No, it is a cliche. <laughs> but maybe, maybe, may, female reporters could have been better in the position to also cover the aspects how to talk to your children who were next to you, you know, um, uh, listening to the to the ambulance cars, to the, the the helicopters over Vienna, and watching the same pictures of. Of this awful uh, and 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 um, and terrible attack. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So maybe it was an anecdote, but I think it's a very important one. Yeah. Uh, let me, perhaps the second statement is also more a statement than a question, but uh, in, in a way it's also a question. One of the statements that you made was that it is a positive that the amount of female reporters or female journalists in your uh, in your sample. analysis increased mm -hmm. or in your sample increased. I couldn't one put it also the other way around, which would be the job is getting less and less attractive because uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the economical pressure is getting more and more intense, yes. in particular when it comes to online media. This is not really a very pleasant job. In particular, if you are a freelancer, um, uh, this is you are really under heavy and, vulnerable, and yeah. pressure and you're vulnerable, etc. Yeah. And the typical outcome of such a situation in a job is that more and more female enter the market yeah. because men try to avoid this. So that couldn't one read this not as a success story, uh, but on the contrary, as a part of the problem or as a symbol or a sign of the problem, which is that the whole industry is in crisis and therefore may have women enter the job. Unfortunately, I couldn't agree more again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> and uh, obviously, this is uh, this po always um, uh, points to the limitations of these uh, kind of methods uh, that you could use for, for example, surveying the media, because there you have to mm -hmm. deal with uh, quantitative methods. So you have to count the numbers. But these numbers are, as you said, they, um, uh, they could be interpreted in various ways. One of the one of the way to interpret is that, you know, it's a kind of um, major um, uh, objective to have gender inequality within the media industry, saying that um, women and men should uh, get equal chances to get a job in the media. However, a more important aspect within this uh, we, uh, from this in this perspective would be also how many men and women are in decision-making positions in the media, right? And those jobs that are stable, that are well-paid, and there you don't have not even close to quality, uh, parity in terms of uh, gender equality within the Austrian media. On the other hand, yes, <clears throat> and um, there are uh, many uh, colleagues and many researchers who are fo uh, focusing on uh, how much vulnerable this job became especially uh, because uh, media outlets are forcing their workforce to, to work as uh, freelancers, basically exploiting them. And how, how much um, uh, uh, here, again, the gendered aspects that if the number of women are raising here, it's not a straightforward, positive kind of um, 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 uh, phenomena and trend in that sense. But as you said, very rightly so, that um, the, another interpretation the, to, the, to this is that uh, more women are entering a job market that is, um, that is prone to um, uh, um, exhaustion of the workforce and, uh, and misuse of, of the labor workforce. Yeah, uh, let me perhaps finish by coming from my side mm -hmm. uh, by coming back to the to the Hungarian part before. I mean, one of the one of the interesting uh, issues that are, in my view, debated at the moment in communication sciences is in how far this position to become a journalist is something where you need to be able to afford this. So you need to be able to go to through three or four or five unpaid. Uh, jobs where you are completely exploited in order to be able to then enter a low level position somewhere and then to make up your way mm -hmm. so that uh, that journalism is more and more becoming a, a profession of either an elite who is not really depending on the money that comes every month yep. or by people who are completely vulnerable so that there is a distinction in this and I would expect if this is true uh, that the very th same thing happens in Hungary because I would expect that it is not really a very attractive thing to become a journalist in Hungary at the moment, right? So if, 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 if your professional perspective is that you either end up as one person claiming how successful 
uh, the government <laughs> doing, or you end up in a situation where you are very close to jail, uh, or or you are literally uh, in at risk to be in jail. Um, that is not something that people would probably see as an attractive position. So so how 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 would you see this in developing, and in particular, how, is there anything? from a legal perspective or from a political perspective that would need to be done in Austria, for example, or in, within the European Union to stop this tendency? Yes. <laughs> um, my answer is a absolutely straightforward, but yes, that there should be and there could be done a lot. So first of all, you are absolutely right. Uh, journalism in many parts of the world, in, and definitely Hungary is one of those parts of the world, um, and becoming a journalist is right now something that only the crazy people do. Um, <clears throat> if, if you, you know, it was a, it was a prestigious job mm -hmm. for, for decades. And then it then came the first economic crisis, uh, 2008, um, um, uh, across the globe, but, but hardly uh, hit uh, also Europe. And the 2008 crisis was the first when the media became extremely vulnerable. And the, the, and the media and the traditional quality media, especially, basically never recovered from the 2008 economic crisis. And that was the moment when even the best and the most uh, outstanding media outlets started to to, 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 to put in place um, exploitative labor measures, basically pushing their employees, becoming freelancers and, uh, and, uh, and uh, be in very often unpaid positions. Um, and yes, very often the result is that it's either the elites or it's, um, you know, it's just people who doesn't really care what they do, uh, I'm, I'm referring here uh, to the Hungarian case. So in Hungary, you have now hundreds of uh, hundreds or over uh, uh, um, thousands of media outlets that, which are basically financed by the government mm. and um, be, which are not doing anything than uh, <clears throat> spreading government propaganda. And the, the job of a jour journalist, if you could call a person, you know, translating or disseminating uh, government information um, as, uh, as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as news, um, those people basically don't really care about what they do. They just want to have a job. And um, <clears throat> what, what is extremely important here uh, is, uh, in my view, uh, the role of public service media. Mm -hmm. And here a lot could be done. And, um, and how much a country which puts an emphasis on media freedom as a democratic value invests in public service media because that's the place where you could make a difference. And that's the place where under strict regulations, uh, people should not and could not be exploited. Um, and if you... You know, if you just consider the debates about ORF funding, and if you and now I'm turning back to to the Austrian case, and and whether ORF is overfinanced or underfinanced, I think this is this is the one of the, one of the areas where this aspect of exploitation and um, and this aspect of um, of labor market vulnerability should be much much more taken into consideration when when. Austria, you know, is uh, discussing, for example, the budgetary needs of, of ORF. Mm -hmm. But this is just one example that, um, that, uh, that, uh, that, yes, there should be and could be done a lot about the, the mm -hmm. labor market situation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christina. I think I, I learned unbelievably much uh, from this. Um, and I, I, I consumed now almost 100 minutes of your time. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh. Oh, so I'm really okay. sorry for this. Uh, thank you I so would, much. I, but I would not like to end without asking you whether there's anything that you want to add, anything that I should have asked you, anything that we should go deeper into. Um, I think I made all my points. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful format. Um, I think this is really, really 
great to have a chance to to discuss issues and and questions in in more depth that yeah. is very 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 rarely um, is given so mm -hmm. thank you so much to to do this series of discussions i was listening to colleagues uh, of the asboni series and i'm really encouraging everyone else to listen to your series because it's it's really really great to to get into topics and and have the time and um, and i love podcasts i love videos right now you know mm -hmm. there's so many situations you can listen to this so thank you so much for thank inviting you. me thank you thank you that's very kind of you christina very much appreciate it so thank enjoy you. the day uh, have a good weekend and my dear listeners and uh, viewers have a safe uh, weekend stay healthy stay interested and stay in touch with us all the best bye bye bye